Welcome to this episode of The Square. Today, we're exploring design lessons from teachers, what teachers want from their workplace, from the design of the school, what their biggest pain points and challenges are, and what their hopes are for the classroom. I'm here with Sangeetha Karthik from Corgan's Education Practice and Melissa Holting from Hugo. Welcome. Thank Thank you. So lots of headlines about the shortage of teachers in classrooms. But it's not just tied to the pandemic. This is a profession that's struggled to attract and retain talent. So Geetha, earlier you mentioned to me something about a, p- a leaky pipeline. Do you want to explain to me what you meant by that? Yeah, I think the, the context was a little bit different in that case. Um, they were talking about women in STEM in particular, um, but I thought that analogy was very apt in this case as well. Um, you know, you could attract the the folks to the profession at an education level, but you also need to be able to retain them over the course of their career uh, for them to be fulfilled, for them to be successful. And if you're not able to do that along the way, you're going to start losing a lot of folks. And what the pandemic has done is it's really accelerated um, that episode, if you would. And so you have a lot of folks, uh, a lot of teachers that were towards, oh, racing towards retirement that went ahead and retired um, and um, which is a, a bigger problem is that you've got some really talented younger folks um, that just started the profession that have uh, been really disillusioned and have left left for uh, greener pastures. Yeah. So it's really an issue of burnout even, right? In 2019, Corgan did a survey of a thousand teachers from kindergarten through the 12th grade. And we learned just the amount of pressure that they're under and how much their work day impacts that and what it feels like to be in school and to be able to teach these curriculums. We found out just how much the design of the classroom impacted their ability to teach, what it felt like to be there, their satisfaction, their productivity, and even ultimately student outcomes, right? So, but school and education's changed a lot over the past couple of years. So Melissa, do you wanna share with me why we decided to revisit that study? Absolutely. So 2019 was before so much in our world has changed. So we wanted to repeat that study in 2022 to be able to tell how perspectives and pain points in the built environment have changed um, and how teachers view themselves in that environment too. You know, we're talking a leaky pipeline, but it was always there. It's just getting highlighted. So what can the built environment do to better it? So we repeated the 2019 survey with a thousand teachers evenly divided over K through 12. Um, but we also wanted to grow on that. We did interviews to really talk with teachers um, and drill down into these specific aspects in the built environment that can be improved or what are they really struggling with in their current workplace. Yeah. So, you know, on the heels of remote learning, hybridity, new technology, I know that I've certainly wrestled with being in person and then seeing the team's chat come up and like, is this going to be an in-person thing? Is this virtual? And kind of how those worlds sort of collapse on each other. What are some major changes that you saw from how the ways, the ways that teachers maybe experienced the physical environment before the pandemic and what that looks like now? From the original survey to now, no question, the classroom has a very important role, but who it's for has kind of changed over time. In 2019, teachers were really focused on the classroom, helping students while they learn. Now we're kind of at a point where they're considering it just as important to their ability to teach. So we're talking a classroom for very two unique users um, and not just towards student learning. Yeah, it's interesting to think of the classroom as not just a place where students learn, but where teachers work, right? I mean, the concept of of a school as a workplace is one that we learned three years ago. was one that maybe we didn't keep at the forefront of our mind, but certainly had huge repercussions on how a teacher experiences their workplace, right, Sangeetha? That's absolutely right. I think that um, survey was pretty eye-opening, even for a lot of us that have been engaged in the design of um, educational environments for so long, um, because we were hyper-focused on the student outcome, on the student experience, which was all important. Uh, But I think the uh, 2019 survey really opened our eyes to uh, the possibilities. We we know that when the environment is limiting, uh, that does not uh, is not a environment that allows a teacher to excel, which means a student is not getting the best. Um, I think one of the things that uh, stood out in the data that when we compiled the 2022 survey was the fact that they said 39 percent. Um, 
of the respondents said that the physical environment and the, the stressors really affect how they perform. And, and so, so that's a big data point for us that with small interventions, I think we can um, easily overcome and let mm -hmm. teachers be the best they can be. Yeah, absolutely. And while, you know, that has changed, um, their general satisfaction or dissatisfaction with spaces hasn't changed. So it means we maybe aren't addressing it the way they need us to. The only growing dissatisfaction really is around technology-centered spaces in the mm -hmm. school, computer labs, media rooms, all of those sorts of things, because I think we're challenging <laughs> what they were set up for and then being change ready for all of this new integration pieces. You know, it's interesting, Sankitha, that you mentioned 39% of teachers finding this frustration. There's friction with their environment. Mm -hmm. That's up considerably from when we did the survey in 2019. And I think all of us sitting here at the table have sort of benefited from the ways that the workplace has evolved for us, right? Like mm -hmm. we can show up and we can bank on this desk or this table to be here or an outlet for us to plug into. And other places we've kind of seen workplaces respond with break rooms that are stocked with all of our favorite snacks and like not just lo any kombucha, but it's like the local kombucha. And design at school has been a lot slower to respond for teachers and really asking us to think about the school as a workplace. What are some sort of design interventions that you think teachers are looking for and what that data tells us? Um, I think the design interventions um, can be small but impactful. Um, one of the quotes that stood out from the survey was the middle school teacher that said, you know, having an ideal or an optimal workplace for a teacher and having a great learning environment don't have to be mutually exclusive. And um, that really resonated with me because I think uh, we are sort of seeing these as silos. They're not asking for the moon. They're just asking for some, um, some very easy interventions that could be done. So one of the things that we have looked at in the past and we have been incorporating in our designs are these heads down type of spaces um, because in the past um, teacher workrooms have been places where they laminate it, where they're copying, you know, mm -hmm. it's these are loud like, you know, work areas and not for focused heads down work. So this idea where you could actually have some quiet um, privacy to make a phone call with a parent or take, you know, take care of whatever you need to take care of. Um, this idea where you can have a space where you can collaborate with your cohort of teachers or celebrate your successes or even have a moment for yourself. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we've been transforming some of the spaces within the within the campus and there's more that can be done. Um, but I think the other uh, idea that we are looking at is is being able to connect um, the outside in, in t into the building, right, for, for student outcomes. But we could also look at it from our teacher performance um, kind of outlook, if you will, because spaces where they could go and just, you know, take a minute and breathe. Yeah. yeah, that was maybe one of the hardest survey findings to see was, you know, we asked teachers, if you need a moment for yourself to take a phone call or, you know, these are really trying times just to regain composure to go back to your students. Classroom was one, which is not really a private space that's constantly open to other students and teachers interrupting you. And then it got really hard of, you know, I go to my car mm -hmm. to take that moment, or I go to the bathroom. And it just speaks to there not being a space available for those needs to be met. Yeah. Yeah, you know, when I look at our office or mm -hmm. most of the offices that we're designing or that people, the traditional employee goes to, right? There's a variety of spaces to choose from for personal moments but also even just for how we how we need to work in the, in that particular moment right. for the task at hand for the group size that we're working with for the technology that we need um, so it sounds like teachers don't have a space to kind of regroup but can you tell me about where they're also working and what that environment looks like yeah it was interesting too because we asked teachers where do you go to do all of the pieces that are part of your job that are not teaching grading papers um, doing administrative forms all that sort of stuff and still the classroom was number one you would think you know we have teacher focused lounges and offices and workspaces but they're not really using those they're using their home more often than they're using those yeah I, I think I saw in the survey that the same number of people go to their home as they do go to some of the teacher spaces on right. campus, right? Yep. And you mentioned they're using their desk. Can't imagine that competing with colorful bulletin boards or like hanging fish from the ceiling or whatever would yeah. necessarily be well suited for teachers. It 
it's not necessarily that they want to be at the desk, but kind of have to be. Yes, right? I think that's a great point of have to be. Um, but it opens them up for so much more. When we asked them what kind of qualities they wanted in those spaces for that focus work, um, it wasn't to be next to the copier or printer or all of the resources. Their top things were, I want it to be quiet. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be isolated from students, which is understandable, but also other teachers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we talked to some teachers who were quoting to us, ah, you know, I can't focus because on my planning period, if someone else can't focus, they come bother me, which mm -hmm. disrupts my work mm -hmm. and my workflow. Um, so it just was kind of surprising how that came back and what they didn't say was important to them. Mm -hmm. So two major issues, right? Yeah. I need a moment for myself, mm -hmm. maybe regrouping after a difficult conversation, or maybe I even just need to take a phone call with my own kid's pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Don't have a space to do that. Um, and then also not having the spaces that they need for grading papers, mm -hmm. planning lessons plans, all of which are becoming even more and more personalized. So how do you solve for that? What kinds of spaces do you, could you put in or smaller interventions like you mentioned, Sangeetha, mm -hmm. that could help to solve some of these issues? So I'll go first. Um, so I, th I think we are looking more of a workplace type of an environment where whether it's it's a hot desk um, type of scenario, um, some phone rooms or quiet rooms for teachers to um, to get some of these type of tasks done. Um, what is interesting is um, it has permeated the workplace, has been a, a norm for quite a while. Uh, we are seeing a lot of those permeate into the higher education environments as well. and. Um, that's usually how um, the design uh, trends seem to go, right? And so we're seeing a lot of those being added because again, it's all about retention and attracting um, a new folks into the profession and into the institution. Um, and, and having uh, spaces that really look professional and mm -hmm. where they could get several types of tasks done. Yeah, you bring up such a good point, right? Like if I'm going to the classroom, it looks totally different than what this space that we're in looks like. Mm -hmm. um, it's designed with the visual complexities and themings that we would expect to see for mm -hmm. children and to sort of encourage certain behaviors for students. But you're not seeing some of those more elevated materials or finishes or even design furniture selections that you would see. I would imagine that sort of like the actual design and finishes matter, but I think that location would probably matter too about whether these spaces get used or not. Absolutely, you know, teachers are looking for spaces that when they have just a short time to get away and handle something or take a moment to themselves, it needs to be close enough that they can access it and meet those needs. And while they need sight lines to students because you know that's their job during the day is keeping a safe school environment, there still has to be some level of, I, a teacher quoted it this way, a separation of church and state. Where can I go and shut off like the teacher hat while still being a responsible teacher? And so that balance is really important as well to maintain in those spaces. You know, another trend we've seen a lot in the workplace, right? Just because the workplace has to compete with some of the comforts and conveniences of home, right? We learned a lot about ourselves and how we like to work. You know, I, I like to do my focused, work here or you know I really like the thermostat to be super cold and we were able to control some of these things mm -hmm. when it came to working from home and so the workplace we've seen start to adapt and offer those mechanisms to control and tailor our environment and it sounds like schools have evolved in similar ways but really for personalizing education for students right I noticed hey you really struggle with math we got you or hey you really like to read in a little corner we got you. But how do how does school design also provide the same opportunities for personalization and choice for teachers, not only in how they work, but in how they deliver teaching to students and education to students in a more personalized way even? I think the, the way to look at it is uh, with, with personalization of education to the students becoming um, very important I think you have to also cater to the different teaching styles to be able mm -hmm. to allow the teacher to be the best that they mm -hmm. can be um, so I think we were talking about setting up different dials right depending on the curriculum depending about the student group that you are teaching just being able to um, change up your classroom environment where primarily most of the teaching happens is important I think the study again there was a data point in there that said I think they wanted um, 
they are not asking for uber flexibility. They are asking for strategic flexibility where um, it, they can teach not just from one teaching wall. It allows them to move within that um, framework of the classroom, if you will. Um, the idea that they could actually have two groups of students that they can um, teach in different modalities at the same time. Um, and a lot of these are uh, very small or um, low um, resource, you know, interventions that we could very easily do. Um, I, I think um, what I think is uh, very interesting to me is that when we started talking about collaboration spaces, I would say like 10 years ago, um, I think everyone was worried about how it would take away from, you know, circulation spaces. Where are we going to find these spaces in the building? Uh, but I, I think as an educational community, uh, whether you're from the design side or whether you're from the teaching side, we all understood how important it was. So here we are, like, you know, decade later, um, that's something what we do. So I think this pandemic is really sort of the shifting point. And so now we need to take care of those small design interventions for teachers. Um, and so I think this is where we pivot. And we'll be, you know, whether that means um, allowing you to have a, a temperature range within mm -hmm. your classroom that doesn't negatively impact your um, maintenance uh, budget or being able to personalize your space. I think there was an analogy of you know bringing your lamp or your or your plant and and you know just some of those things that um, folks in the workforce just do um, you know without thinking twice. So I think these are um, this is an important time for us to to uh, read through the data. But I think what was engaging or um, uh, much more impactful for me were some of the statements that the teachers had mm -hmm. um, in the survey. So Melissa, I don't know if you want to highlight on some of those as well. Sure. I mean, overall, teachers were finding that they, they couldn't make the classroom when they needed it to be. Um, whether that was the layout, matching how they needed to teach, whether that was COVID related or not, like I just don't have the right furniture for that or enough space for this or that or storage is in the way, all the way to like personalization and choice of how the environment feels you know is this lighting too bright do I need to turn it down are my kids on a laptop and having light right at them or um, is it really warm in here and maybe we need to like close the blinds so that the sun isn't beating in you know they need some level of autonomy to make choices in their classroom mm -hmm. and it's finding like you mentioned that balance of what costs can we maybe minimize? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then what can we give them power over mm -hmm. in their classrooms? So when we asked them about what classroom setup they currently have versus what teaching styles do they like to use, it was completely opposite. Mm -hmm. We were seeing that most often we're using a traditional classroom lecture style, desks all spread out equally facing the same direction, where that is the teaching style teachers use the least. Mm -hmm. So there's a mismatch in the built environment space and how teachers actually approach learning for their students. Yeah, I think this idea of enduring demand or desire for more flexibility is mm -hmm. really interesting, right? Um, I think 82% of teachers mm -hmm. wanted more flexibility. Mm -hmm. um, but that definition of flexibility looks different, right? Yeah. It's, it's not necessarily about giving me more flexibility right. and open-ended possibilities looks a little different, right? Yeah. Tell me how so. And you mentioned 82% say they want more flexibility. And that has stayed the same over time. But their level of satisfaction with the flexibility that they do have is going down. So there's a mismatch. They recognize that there's flexibility in their space, but it's not the kind they need. Mm -hmm. So often we're not talking about big open spaces that can do anything <laughs> that a teacher wants, because that's also challenging them to not only design your curriculum and how you approach your students, but physically design your classroom every mm -hmm. day. And with everything on teacher's plate, that's one more thing they don't that's need right. to be doing. So we're looking at strategic uses of flexibility of saying what are those teaching styles you like to use and how do your students best learn and trying to make a classroom environment that can work for those few scenarios and if 
the classroom camp, making sure that there's a space near the classroom, a breakout space, collaboration space, like you mentioned, um, one with more technology capabilities than the classroom is nearby. So your use cases are being met, but it's not challenging the teacher to figure out how to do it. It's like freedom within fences, yes. mm. kind of, right? Yeah. So give me some guardrails so I know what the heck to do with this right. space yeah. and how to navigate it. You know, Melissa, earlier you brought up gosh, this classroom feels too hot for me. Can I bring the shades down? Or how do I bring a fan in? This idea of physical comfort. And in the office, we've seen places adopt everything from circadian tune lighting to automated roller shades and all of these different design interventions that really speak to our physical comfort and even encourage overall wellness with mindfulness rooms or thoughtful, mindful eating. Um, but for teachers who are, Sangeetha, you shared with me once, sometimes spending half their break running across campus to warm up a meal and then hurrying back to eat it most of the time while they're doing something else. It seems like there might be some challenges to incorporate some of these wellness solutions that we're seeing in the workplace, but how could you adapt these for the school? So I think um, the first is realizing the importance of it. Um, you know, I think I keep going back to the collaboration spaces, right? Like it was not something we put in a program. Um, I think just acknowledging that these types of spaces are needed, then uh, it is very easy to work into a, a campus design. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've always uh, been focused on students, which is very important, and they will always be our primary user group. Uh, but I think we are um, leaving a lot of, um, you know, a lot of possibilities on the table, if you would. Um, but, I, but, you know, when we pitch some of these ideas, I think uh, uh, clients today are much more receptive because they do see the need for it and say, oh, this is all I need to do. So instead of, you know, one large copy room, the idea that um, you can have multiple spaces for teachers and then uh, confine the, the making and the doing into one zone, which is centrally located, but have uh, other thoughtful spaces for the teachers to decompress, to have a meal, um, providing them with some amenities, whatever the campus can afford, yeah. um, clo in close proximity to their students, uh, whether it's a classroom pod or a classroom wing, um, are pretty easy to do. I think, I, I think we've um, left a lot of opportunity on the table that uh, we can leverage. The same uh, goes to, um, you know, th those heads down spaces that you were talking about. Um, uh, why can't those be something that they share with the students, right? Especially in the upper um, grade levels, like mm -hmm. high st school students have these um, small uh, study spaces, if you will. There's a lot of line of sight, you know, for obvious reasons, um, but those you could um, segue a portion of those rooms for teachers and 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 quickly alter the environment for their needs whether it's for a quick touchdown um, space or a quick meeting with <laughs> with a co-worker okay. so I think um, I think the first um, challenge that we have on our hands is really acknowledging that these spaces are needed and then um, then the next step would be incorporating them into the design yeah I love that idea of uh, hub and spoke model and that some of those spaces you know you want to benefit teachers but it could be that they're benefiting everybody mm -hmm. that quote you mentioned at the beginning of it working just for students doesn't mean it can't work for teachers um, and when we talk well being in the environment a lot of things we've focused on in schools of offering you know time for lunch and appropriate food and nutrition and light and air quality and physical comfort for students that all stands true for teachers as well mm -hmm. and maybe even more so we've been using this analogy a lot in the study of teachers need to first put on their oxygen mask before they can help anyone else yeah. es especially as students come back from a really hard time and need extra support teachers went through that hard time too mm -hmm. so how can we better support them in the built environment so that they can better support their students so it sounds like even smaller interventions like hanging plants or dimmable lights can really activate different spaces for teacher and student wellness. And the idea of wellness becomes even more important when we think about the challenges of having to wrestle with the physical needs of the environment, now layering in technology. Um, can you talk to me about how this idea of technology and physical spaces and hybrid environments collapsing in on each other um, certainly have created pain points for students, right? As they mm -hmm. kind of look at the gap in learning or access to re some of these resources at home. What are some of the challenges that teachers are wrestling with now? Because 
of this new model of learning. Yeah, and technology is not going away, and teachers don't necessarily want it to. Maybe the virtual at home all day, every day, but that there is value incorporating it into their classroom, but there are definitely challenges to integration. You know, teachers saying students have their laptop out all day and it dies and they go, well, I can't do my work because it's not charged. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, I can't look at my book and my laptop because my desk is too small to fit both. Or, you know, all of these sorts of things that teachers are finding to really be a challenge. And technology integration is one of those things that they listed as being limiting in their environments. I, I think what is also interesting is uh, with how important technology is becoming, the, mm -hmm. the physical world becomes more important. Back to what you said about the, the furniture sizes being so small and the, uh, the, the thought that you don't have enough power in the classroom. All those are physical challenges, but they are all directly tr tied to yeah. technology. Um, and, and I think one of the things we often discuss is all these challenges existed. They've always been part of uh, school environments. Uh, what has been in interesting is this pandemic has shed light on a lot of the challenges that schools were already facing, um, mm -hmm. but that have become complicated due to the technology interventions that have been part of a classroom environment. That's what they do all day, every day. Then you layer that in with the, the hybrid environment where you do have, you know, we saw that a lot when we were getting back to the new normal where you still had some students in the virtual environment and you had students in the physical environment and, and then the teacher trying to make the projection screen work for, for both groups where um, the experience for those students that are in the campus are, are you know are not good because you know they're trying to mess with everything um online and then the kids that are on the virtual platform are not enjoying an optimal experience either so you know here you have somebody that's stressing out about mm -hmm. trying to serve two groups of um, you know two different groups uh what is interesting though i think the the hybrid environment will still remain in in some mm -hmm. modality even into the future uh, we are seeing um, uh, the emergence of some hybrid um, schools you know very small percentage but that's already starting to to creep in and so if that's the case so what happens if we you know have a week of of ice or snow we have bad weather days yeah. that does are schools equipped to be able to deliver that instruction even for a short term, right? Like we don't want to go back and, and, and think that 2020 is going to repeat itself. <laughs> um, good God, no. But, uh, but just this idea for a short duration, yeah. is your classroom equipped to at least handle it uh, for an optimal student experience? Right. Handle it, and then technology integration also looking different when they come back to the classroom. You know, companies are trying to draw people back into the workplace by offering them something they can't get at home. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the teachers we talked to in the interviews, there's an opportunity here when you integrate tech for this to look the same for students. Mm -hmm. You know, at home, on your laptop, it was isolating. It was individual work. It was all these things that kind of kept students in their own bubble. But that how can tech in the classroom be more focused towards group? It, learning and putting people together and more facilitating something that you wouldn't do at home mm -hmm. and not just one in the same and why am I at school if I'm yeah. doing the same thing I was doing at home which yeah. we say about work all of the time um, so that is a really unique opportunity for that tech integration while still supporting teachers when the students aren't there and you might have to do it from home because snow days may be a thing of the past now yeah that's right <laughs> sorry well, students <laughs> well what, what's interesting though it's uh, with the uh, importance of technology just everywhere you know the the social um, mm -hmm. aspect of it becomes uh, important so you know as adults we we've been hopefully equipped um, and we we know how to behave in a in a social setting and so you know it didn't set us back well you have a lot of students you have a lot of kids that you know you know you're spooning uh, you know that was that that were born during the pandemic yeah, yeah. And so, you know, they don't know any different. I think um, there are several studies that are tracking students that started their kindergarten year in 2020 mm. in the uh, in the hopes that they are going to track the, their entire um, educational career till they hit 18, because wow. I think they are trying to uh, gather some data. And I think the, the study that I was talking about talked about how these kids um, don't know any different than everyone in mass because that's what they are used to. Right. Um, so, you know, they just thought kindergartners wore masks when they started um, school. It's yeah. funny. We had a teacher talking to us about 
obviously there are some different pieces of development that happen when they, everyone was in COVID. But as students were coming back, he was saying, I have eighth graders who want to go out and swing on the swings and play on the jungle gym, you know, things they were doing on their recess break before they went home yeah. because they miss those opportunities or that's kind of where they're at and like social development and yeah. what they want to do with their time. It's definitely more playful, more engaging. Yeah. Um, and so environments that do that, not just for younger students, you know, doing that for older students can be beneficial as well. So it sounds like there's this return to the physical environment, but the desire that things like technology not overtake that experience, but really enhance it to mm-hmm. meet us where we are. Um, everything from which technology is available for us to use and when a teacher may want to tap into a certain tool um, to being able to have the right dials to kind of create that comfort that they need or that their students need. So the well building standard outlines these scientifically backed measurable interventions that considers the wellness and the health of the people and culture inside. How do you adapt that and interpret it for the educational environment to consider the health and wellness of students and teachers? Absolutely. So, you know, with the the well building standard, we're looking at seven major concepts, light, air, physical comfort, mind health, nutrition, fitness, all of these sorts of things um, that as you come back to in-person experiences to optimize that for each user requires some tuning, you know, some personalization and choice to be able to make those work for you. What I find comfortable for focus work may not be what Sangeetha or you mm-hmm. Poonam find comfortable for focus work. So teachers being able to do that for themselves and helping students learn how to evaluate those needs for themselves and making those choices is really important as well. So time and time again, we've heard from teachers in 2019 and 2022 that there's an enduring value from their physical environment to influence what it feels like to be at work, but also the quality of that work. And that they need the agency and the autonomy to be able to manipulate that environment for themselves and for their students. Um, But we've also heard that there's all these outside pressures that impact that. How does design serve as a partner for teachers to help them create the spaces they need to succeed? And what do you think this is gonna mean for classrooms going forward? I, th- I think um, I think again going back to the flexibility and then being strategic mm-hmm. about providing those amenities um, within a framework. Um, again, these are all um, just those statements that we make. I think it could be interpreted differently for every client and for every campus. And and everybody understands that you know not we just need to have some parameters that can, we could check off to allow the mm-hmm. personalization, the yeah. dials that we talked about earlier, um, where you optimize the student experience, but you also allow the the teacher to excel. But I think the the most important takeaway for me as a designer, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's very engaged in educational environments is um, you know bringing this issue to the table and letting the decision makers know that we've heard uh, the teachers and these are very small um, if if not meaningful interventions that can happen. Mm-hmm. And it could mean different things for different clients. It could be uh, mean different things for different teachers, depending on the groups of students that they serve. Yeah. But this idea that you know we are thinking about them and we could actually provide some of these amenities for them, I think is the key takeaway for me. Absolutely, and I think for me, you know, the built environment, obviously we always try to do, do no harm. You never want this to affect someone negatively. And maybe we've lived in a world of neutral, Mm -hmm. but what we're really hoping design will do now is challenge to have an active role that betters the experience and well-being for teachers, which in succession benefits students, Mm -hmm. and then hopefully learning and all of those outcomes that you're looking for, but that our built environment has an active role in that equation. Well, thank you so much, Sangeetha and Melissa. This has been really great. You're welcome. welcome. Thank you. And thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time on The Square.